Hello, this is our final um, lecture, our final notes on development. It's all about adulthood. Um, it covers a lot of years, but there's not a lot of information to go with it. So let's get started. Um, first, let's talk about um, the early and middle adulthood. This is 20 to 65, so a lot of years here. Um, we're gonna talk about social development. Um, early adulthood is often centered around careers. I mean, it's a chunk of people's lives at this time. Um, I mean, that's what they're focused on. I mean, that's what they do with their, a lot of their time. Um, midlife transition, there is one, um, occurs in person's in their 40s, when one may question his or her life and accomplishments, um, do mainly because of physical changes and the idea that life will end at some point. I mean, they're starting to realize that the life they have left, the amount of time they have left, is shorter than the life than the amount of time that they have lived. So they're starting to recognize that, um, and they're you know they're they're seeing that there's an end coming. Um, for most people, however, this passage into this middle life is relatively calm. Many, instead of focusing on the past, like with regrets or, you know, with, I wish I was back then or the future, oh my God, I'm running out of time, they focus on the present and come to terms with one's circumstances. And, um, you know, they really do try to focus on the here and now. Um, one thing I want to kind of um, make sure we take this connection to what we've already studied um, when we were talking Erickson, he has that generative, generative versus stagnation um, stage. That's This is the stage, like this career oriented, um, trying to, um, you know, not be stagnant in their development and their growth. Um, also on this, we're going to talk about marriage, children, and family. I mean, this is what a lot of people focus on during this time period as well, besides their career. Um, people are still getting married, but rates of living together as well as divorce are higher. Um, so marriage is still very much an institution in our society, in our culture, but, um, it's changing and around 90% of heterosexual couples or adults will marry and 75% of divorcees will remarry. About 50% of first marriages are ending in divorce. Um, and we can spend hours talking about how they came up with that 50, how they come up and um, figure out that 50% are ending in divorce. Um, but I don't want you to get down on marriage or think negatively of marriage because 75% of those that are experiencing divorce go back and remarry. So they're not souring on the experience. Um, so it's obviously not a bad thing. Um, another issue in uh, or what we want to focus on is women's roles in during this time period. Close to 75% of all married women with school aged children are working outside the home. Um, so it's a large chunk of, you know, the society and it's much higher than it was 20 to 30 years ago. Most working women are coming home to do the majority of the housework. It's like a second shift. Um, according to sociologist Arlene um, Hotchchild, employed mothers put in an extra month of 24 hour days during the course of a year. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of time that they're doing in addition to their career, their job that they get paid for. Yet most women who work report a personal satisfaction and sense of contributing to society. So, you know, they're getting a benefit from working outside of the home. Um, but, you know, they still, women on average are still carrying the load of housework at home. Um, moving into late adulthood, which is 65 plus, um, we're going to talk some physical changes because there's physical changes that are happening at 65 plus. Um, there's thinning of hair and graying of hair, even though those two things may happen earlier, especially the graying of hair um, can start as early as, you know, some in their 30s, um, definitely into their 40s. People are noticing that graying of hair, but it's their hair is gray really after 65 plus their skin is wrinkling and there's a slot, slight loss of height. Senses are less sensitive. Um, reaction time slows and changes in physical stamina. So, um, 
your grandparents may put a lot of seasoning or salt and pepper on their food because they don't, their taste buds are less sensitive. Um, driving, um, you know, reaction times in driving. So there are people who are concerned that maybe we should be asking older individuals to retake driver's tests to ensure that they still um, are safe to operate a vehicle because of that slowing reaction time. So what causes these um, physical changes. Well, you have genetic programming theory of aging, and that is built in time, um, a time limit to the reproduction of cells. It's kind of like an automatic self-destruct button has been pushed, um, very doomsday-ish. Um, and then there's the wear and tear theories of aging. Mechanical functions of the body simply stop working um, efficiently as people age. Eventually the body just kind of wears out like an old automobile. Um, you know, I mean, you're getting old. There's, um, you know, they just kind of wear out. And gravity does take effect. So on that wear and tear, just gravity alone is going to cause some issues. All right, later adulthood also, let's talk about cognitive changes. Of course, cognitive, we mean thinking. So there is some decline in intellectual functioning during late adulthood. Um, skills relating to fluid intelligence do show declines in old age, yet skills relating to crystallized intelligence remain steady. Um, so remember, um, we talked about both of these in the intelligence chapter. So fluid intelligence is their re, um, your response to new situations. Um, how you respond, how do you handle new situations, that does decline with old age, yet their crystallized intelligence, they, like, they know it. They are holding steady. They've got those memories there. Um, and they know a lot. I mean, they have a lot of information. So does memory really decline with old age? Most evidence says not really. The neural processing slows down, which in turn causes it to take longer to process the memories. So like when you take an intelligence test, the older you are at 65 plus, the neural processing slows down. So it looks like they've lost intelligence because they're timed. Most memory loss tends to be limited to episodic memories. I mean, hello, they have a lot of episodic memories. So of course they're gonna get a lot of interference. Is it proactive or reactive interference? And other types, but other types are largely unaffected by age. If a person stays active, remember, you're supposed to develop the habits back in your, you know, teens and early 20s, physically and mentally, the memory loss seems to almost be non-existent. Some memory loss, though, is due to disease and Alzheimer's disease, like Alzheimer's. Oh, all right, social. So the social world of late adulthood. So how does one successfully age? There's a couple of theories here. You have disengagement theory of aging. Aging produces a gradual withdrawal from the world on physical, psychological, and social levels. Um, okay, so you withdraw from the world. You, you know, get your inner circle even smaller. It's not a bad thing if you think about it. I mean, you're at your end of your life. This, this disengagement provides opportunity for increased reflectiveness and decreased emotional investment in others at a time in life when social relationships are inevitably be ending by death. So a lot of relatives that are the same age or relative age as the individual potentially are dying. Um, their close friends that they've had for decades are also dying. So they're starting that, that to kind of cease some emotional connections to make it easier to process the fact that they are at the end of their life. Um, the other theory is um, the active, active activity theory of aging, people who age most successfully are those who maintain the interests, activities, and level of social interaction they experience during middle adulthood. So this theory says late adulthood should reflect a continuation as much as possible of the activities in which people participated during the earlier part of their lives. So um, how do you successfully age? Well, there's this theory of, oh, kind of isolate yourself. And there's this other side that says, hey, keep being active. You will, you know, help with, you know, you will fight off depression and, you know, you stay active and you don't fall into um, kind of um, 
a dark kind of trap. So which is better? Well, it depends on the situation. It depends on the individual and it depends on that individual's personality. Um, we will be getting to personality in a couple of units. Now, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, name you gotta know. She spent much of her career studying tragedy, death, dying, and the cycle of grief grief as it relates to these events, especially the end of life. Um, from her research, she developed the five stages of grief that all people facing death or grief experience, but in no particular order. Okay, repeat, no particular order. You go through these in any order, um, you might cycle back through them. So denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Um, and you might cycle through some of those um, on and off as you process this grief. Um, and I think they're pretty much self-explanatory. So I'm not going to um, go through them in a lot of detail. Um, you can see that these stages when dealing with many of the traumas we encounter in life. Okay. So it's not just end of life death that you're going to see these. It's any type of loss, whether it's from a terminal illness, um, a, you know, um, or to dealing with the death of a loved one or other loss, such as ending a relationship, a friendship, a long-term friendship, or a romantic relationship, you will still go through these stages of grief.